Welcome everyone to the 3MT, Amherst College's three minute thesis competition. I'm Susan Daniels, I'm the associate in public speaking here at the college, and it is my sincere pleasure to be here today, welcome you to this event and serve as the host. If you could take just 60 seconds to turn off your cell phones at this time, it's Murphy's Law, right, that the one person you come to see when they get up there, your phone goes off loud and proud. And while you're taking your one minute to turn off your cell phone, I'm gonna take 60 seconds to tell you the brief history of the 3MT, because it's pretty funny. In 2008, the Three Minute Thesis was born in Queensland, Australia, and it was because there was a severe drought in the country and there was a mandate that you had to conserve water. Every household was allowed to only take a three minute shower and they were issued a three minute egg timer. So the person that was the dean of the graduate school at the time was in the shower, this is the story, in the shower, and at a minute two and a half, he thought, wow, I'm getting just as clean now as I would have if I had luxuriated for 20 minutes in this shower. I think I have an idea for my PhD research students. If I can get clean in two and a half minutes under three minutes, I think they can explain the significance of their research in three minutes. And now we have over 900 universities in 85 countries that have been allowed to take part in the three minute thesis competition. And I am proud to say that Amherst College is one of those 900. And everybody's cell phone is off, magic. <laughs> Before we start, I want to thank some very special people without whom we would not have been able to produce this event. The IT department, especially Pete Marvin, Will Fournier, and Asha Kinney. The Office of Communication, we have a representative right here, Marcus DeMaio. The Office of the Provost, and we have the president of the college walking across. <laughs> thank you, President Elliott. <laughs> My name is Michael, but I'm not the president. No. <laughs> the other Michael. <laughs> Most of all, I would like to thank the Writing Center. The Writing Center has sponsored this event. They do every year. And my colleagues have supported thesis writers throughout their journeys in, at Amherst College. And we are here literally today because of all of their support of these thesis writers. Today, 10 thesis writers nominated by their departments and chosen as finalists will compete to communicate the significance of their thesis in three minutes. I want to just give extra applause for these 10 because in addition to learning the skill of how to communicate clearly and concisely their whole thesis, they were writing their thesis. One wrote two theses. <laughs> and they turned them in on time, and they defended them. So let's give them a great big round of applause. I'll be mentioning this in a little while, but before I forget, please know that your programs serve as ballots, which I'll talk about later on. So I'm gonna ask that you respect these 10 speakers. They're very quick, as you know, they're only three minutes long. Wait until they're all done before you leave if you can, thank you. I wanna introduce you to the judges because they are the three from the community that have been brought in to help choose the winners for this contest. I'd like to introduce Jaris Hansen first. You can just raise your hand, Jaris. There she is. Jaris is a professor emerita of, of communications at UMass Amherst, and she's a professional actor. She's also the arts columnist for Theater Matters at the Valley Advocate, our paper. Jaris is aptly suited to judging a three-minute thesis competition because she took the entire life of Frances Perkins the first Secretary of Labor in the United States, first female Secretary of Labor in the United States, and she turned that life into a 90-minute, one-woman show that she's touring with now. So welcome, Jaris.
our next judge, Andrew Grant Thomas. And you can wave your hands, so everybody can see you. Co-founder and co-director of Embrace Race, a national uh, nonprofit that supports caregivers to raise children who are thoughtful, informed, and brave about race. Andrew is delighted, I hope, to serve as a judge for this contest for the sixth time. So thank you, Andrew. Last but certainly not least, Peter Sokolowski is editor-at-large at Merriam-Webster. He has written definitions for many where Merriam-Webster dictionaries, is active as a blogger, a podcaster, and a speaker on language, and has served as pronouncer for Spelling Bees Worldwide. A fun fact about Peter is that he was named among Time's 140 best Twitter feeds of 2013. Now that might have been 10 years ago, but mine have never been nominated. So good job, Peter. Thank you, Jeffrey. Those are the judges that will judge the first place and the runner up. But remember that you, our audience, will be the judge of the People's Choice Award today. So as you watch each speaker, don't only listen and take notes about content of what they're saying, but also in how they say it, um, because that's going to be really important too in the judging, is content and presentation. After the last speaker, we will have some ushers come and collect your programs, which I mentioned before serve as ballots. We have pencils available if anyone needs a pencil to write, but you'll notice that next to each name is a circle, and we just ask that you color in the circle, only one please, that is your choice, for the people's choice. After we collect, we will take a short break. I hope that you stay to hear the winners, and then we'll come back and announce the winners. One thing special to know is that we are committed to awarding three separate speakers, three separate awards. So in the event that a student wins first place or runner up, and they also happen to get the largest amount of votes for people's choice, we will then go down the list and choose the next person get, that got the next largest amounts of votes for the people's choice so that everyone, all three, get three different awards. And without further ado, I would like everybody to just sit back, relax, and enjoy the three-minute thesis competition. Our first speaker from the Neuroscience Department is Aditi Nayak, and the name of her speech is Space Flight and Aging is Zinc the Link. What is our relationship to the universe? This existential question has driven humanity to build whole spacecrafts with which we hope one day to explore settings like this light years away where we might discover that there's new planets, new forms of life, and understanding that there's more to the universe than our experience here on Earth could revolutionize the way we live life on Earth. Spaceflight is inspirational, but could it be more? What if we use space, what could spaceflight teach us if we look at our relationship to the environment, not in this existential way, but more in a practical sense? How does space travel impact the human body? And yes, it actually does impact the human body, but most people, even scientists, don't pay enough attention to this. You see, our, our bodies have evolved under Earth's atmosphere, under this blanket, to the specific environment. But spacecraft takes our bodies beyond this environment and exposes us to a brand new set of stressors. Ionizing radiation can damage the central nervous system and damage the blood-brain barrier. Reduced and changing gravity levels can actually build pressure in the brain and compromise our vision and also cause cognitive damage. Even you and I, though we might not know, may never go to space, we will also experience these biological changes at some point in our lifetime through a process called aging. The biological response to spaceflight actually resembles aging. It just happens so much faster. That is why I believe that spaceflight can actually be a mechanism for us to accelerate our understanding of what happens to the body as we age. Through my thesis, I took this metaphor seriously and I asked, how can a key contributor of aging 
actually help us understand what happens to the body during spaceflight. And that key player is zinc. The brain tightly regulates zinc concentrations through a whole network of protein and organelle stores. And even the smallest changes to these protein networks can contribute to brain damage that manifests in aging. And even though the same brain damage occurs during spaceflight, no one has looked at how zinc regulating proteins change during this journey. Until my thesis. <laughs> During my thesis, I took genetic records of humans and rodents that were sent to spaceflight, and I checked for these zinc-regulating proteins that were differentially expressed during aging to see if they were also changed during spaceflight, and guess what they were? A lot of these same proteins were changed during spaceflight, which suggests that maybe if we can equilibrate and control these zinc-regulating mechanisms, maybe we can mitigate the effects to the central nervous system that this universe has on our body. Based on my findings, our lab has actually successfully requested brain tissue from rodents that NASA sent to the International Space Station. And I'm excited to look at this tissue to see if these zinc-regulating proteins are changed over spaceflight as the data suggests. And my thesis not only establishes zinc as a target that we can treat and protect astronaut health, moreover, it shows us that the resemblance between spaceflight and aging, it's not just phenotypic, maybe there's a mechanism that's shared with zinc as a link in this mechanism. Based on my findings, what we could do in the future is take astronaut therapeutics and repurpose them to, treat the, to revolutionize the way we treat aging here on Earth. So what do we learn from space travel? Yes, it helps us satisfy this curiosity about what the world is out there, but I believe we can learn so much more. If we use space travel not as science fiction, but as a real scientific tool, we could revolutionize the way we treat aging to live healthier and longer lives here on Earth. Our next speaker from the Political Science Department is Molly Hartenstein, and the name of her speech is The Unfulfilled Promise. 250 years ago, the Founding Fathers made a promise to all Americans and to the world that America would be a country committed to equality and justice. And yet, from the beginning of our nation until today, that promise has gone unfulfilled. Limitations on political participation, from preventing women from voting to the spread of election denialism, have consolidated political power in the hands of the few at the expense of the American people. Today, the leading cause of death in America is preventable illness. The majority of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, and the average American is nearly $60,000 in debt. My thesis seeks to better understand this distance between the promise of America and the America we live in today by asking how this disconnect was created and expanded over the course of American political history. My thesis began by going back in time to understand the origins of the unfulfilled promise. I discovered that the founders combined seemingly opposing ideas of self-interest and public good as dual purposes of government, opening up infinitely many possibilities for America's future. But by combining different methodologies and non-traditional sources, I saw that the founders also limited these possibilities by giving their own voices an outsized role in shaping politics. They were money lenders who created a government much more sympathetic to lenders than to debtors, cementing an imbalance of power for centuries to come. The founders understood political participation to be extremely important in achieving the needs of the public. But when their own interests came into conflict with those of the American people, they decided to prioritize what they wanted instead of fulfilling their promise. Sounds familiar, huh? <laughs> we, the people, need to be the ones to deliver on the founders' promise. Inequality is not a symptom of American politics, but a built-in strategy used to further the distance between the self-interest of a select few and the true public good. The idea that voting can solve all our problems is not enough. We each have to choose to engage in a politics that deeply matters to us and push the boundaries of what political participation can look like. That is what the founders understood and what we have to realize today to challenge such deeply ingrained inequality. So, take politics into your own hands. Go to town hall meetings, 
Have intentional conversations with your friends and family. Contact your representatives, not just when you're upset about something, but when you think of a change you want to see in your community. Be proactive, not reactive. And organize with people as best you can. What my thesis illustrates is that we cannot provide pragmatic solutions to policy issues until we address the root causes of unequal politics in America, until we take it upon ourselves to fulfill the Founder's promise, and until we redistribute political power equally among all Americans. Our next speaker from the Education Studies Department is August Bates, and the name of their speech is Toward Better College Campuses for Students with Disabilities. At some point in time, almost everyone in this room will have a disability. This could be a physical disability, like losing the ability to walk, but it could also be depression, anxiety, memory loss. For many people, including myself, that diagnosis comes before or during college, impacting our ability to learn in the same way as those around us. And yet consistently, amidst higher education's increasing commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, disability and access are often left out entirely. This is a deeply concerning gap. There are undeniable benefits to a college education, including better access to employment opportunities and higher wages. But historically, those benefits have been unavailable to disabled people. We know from research on two-year and four-year public colleges that people with disabilities often do not enroll in college and that they are less likely to graduate if they do. But to date, there have been few large-scale studies that document the narrative experiences of students at a specific institution, something that has the potential to show us exactly why those trends emerge and what we can do about them. My thesis sought to fill that gap by bringing the voices of disabled students at Amherst to the forefront. I posed the question, what barriers to success might exist for these students, and what can we do to rectify them so that they can fully access their education? I surveyed and interviewed students with disabilities, asking them to provide their experiences with accessibility services, academics, and other aspects of student life. The results were striking. On the whole, students with disabilities felt less like they had the same opportunity to succeed academically as their peers. Some spoke of difficulty getting the accommodations they needed due to misunderstandings or faculty pushback. Many had encountered inaccessible classroom practices, including strict attendance or participation policies. Others struggled to find a sense of belonging or a community, something that is a big part of Amherst's appeal as a small campus and, more broadly, of college success. So what can we do about it? First, we acknowledge what they are going through, and we use this research to emphasize the importance of continuously listening to disabled students. Then, we target the specific issues they brought up at Amherst. We begin to carve out dedicated spaces for disabled community building, and we increase the visibility of accessibility resources on campus. Finally, we use the changes made here as a stepping stone inviting other similarly situated institutions to join us in crafting more accessible campuses. If higher education is truly committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we must consider access for disabled students a part of those goals. When we listen to the stories of students with disabilities, we can engage in that collective responsibility. Then we can begin to craft more holistically equitable and inclusive institutions for students of all abilities. Our next speaker from the Physics and Astronomy Departments is Kaylin Plunkett, and the name of her speech is Look Up to Look In. We study others to understand ourselves. Since the dawn of human history, we've looked to different groups to understand who we are and how we got here. And when we looked up, we found Mercury, Venus, Neptune, a lineup of planets I used to have on my favorite childhood placemat describing Earth's special place in the universe. But when we looked beyond our solar system bubble, we found wild worlds. Giant Jupiters practically touching the suns they orbit, frozen Saturns 30 times farther than Pluto. 
and we realized our perfect placemat picture of planets was incomplete. We have to study planets around other stars in order to place our own existence and evolution into a universe-wide context. But there's a problem. Stars are very bright, and planets are very dim. Taking a picture of a planet around another star is like taking a picture of a firefly next to a lighthouse from across the continental United States. <laughs> that, as we say in the biz, is hard. <laughs> so we miss things. Maybe the star was just too bright. Maybe the planet was hidden behind the star. The planets we've detected can't tell the full story. They're biased and incomplete. So how can we say anything with confidence? My thesis fills the gaps in what we did see by determining what we could have seen. In doing so, I correct that bias and help us figure out what is really out there. I developed a way to simulate all the ways a still growing planet can appear. I look at baby planets because they teach us how they initially formed, something we still don't understand. There are many models for how planets gobble up dust and gas to grow, but until my thesis, no one fully compared how those models compared to our image planets because we didn't yet have a framework to do that for young, hungry planets. My simulations tell us what we could have found under each model. How does that let us know which one is correct? Say we found a bunch of planets that one model says we definitely could not have seen. That tells us they weren't formed in that way. I'm now putting limits on how many baby planets are out there around different types of stars. And even with our small initial sample size, I'm starting to rule out some combinations of planetary evolution theories. And it doesn't stop here. The method I created can be applied to any survey of baby planets. The more, the better. As we increase our statistics, we narrow down the possibilities for how we on Earth came to be. We study others to understand ourselves. My thesis brings us closer to understanding how we compare to the others out there, to answering the ultimate question. Are we alone in the universe? Probably not. <laughs> Studying planets is the way to find out. Our next speaker from the Political Science Department is Alice Rogers, and the name of her speech is Accountability in International Relations, the Case of the Central African Republic. I remember the day that the Cameroonian government signed a military cooperation deal with Russia. I was living in Cameroon at the time, and my professor spent the next few hours engaged in anxious conversation about the human rights violations that could result from Russian interference in the country. Statistics suggest that their concerns were well-founded. Russia has been accused of horrific human rights abuses across Africa, including torture, sexual violence, and forced disappearance. Um, as of now, 26 African countries have signed military cooperation agreements with Russia, of which 12 countries have Russian private military companies, which are effectively mercenary groups operating within their borders. For my thesis, I decided to delve deeper into the rise of authoritarian international powers like Russia and China and Africa. I wanted to investigate the question of why we're seeing such a drastic shift in African foreign relations. For my case study, I selected the Central African Republic, a country that has faced a decade of civil war, leading to instability and a humanitarian catastrophe. As part of my methodology, I interviewed a wide variety of Cameroonian academics, civil society actors, and journalists. Their shared belief was that countries like the Central African Republic are turning to Russia and China after decades of frustration with Western human rights hypocrisy. Um, since the colonial period, countries like France have wielded tremendous political, economic, and military influence across Africa. And this level of domination has come with horrific human rights consequences. For example, in 2013, following the outbreak of civil war in the Central African Republic, France and the UN staged an intervention to prevent a potential genocide from occurring in the Central African Republic. There's evidence that France was successful in mitigating these atrocities, but there's also significant evidence that French soldiers committed human rights abuses against children in Central African refugee camps. Although France's abuses might be less prolific than Russia, um, many would nonetheless argue that the French model of engagement in Africa is undemocratic, inhumane, and unequal. We must hold political and economic actors from democratic countries accountable in Africa in order to rectify these injustices. 
In certain cases, Western political actors have taken steps to introduce accountability measures in order to um, hold political actors accountable for human rights abuses abroad. Using my 2013 example, um, a UN whistleblower leaked the allegations to the French authorities who then opened an investigation into the crimes. In the following years, the UN ramped up operations governing the conduct of both its own troops and um, troops of allied countries. If we continue to develop measures to hold our political and economic actors accountable for their actions abroad, we as Western nations might begin to engage internationally in a way that better reflects our values of democracy and human rights. Our next speaker from the Mathematics and Statistics Department is Clara Page. And the title of her speech is, The Clock is Ticking, How Much Time is Left. When do you think you'll die? Six years? Six months? Tomorrow? It's a morbid question, I know, but it's an important one. Because the answer to that question is the reason your doctor knows what medicine will keep you alive. It's how ecologists prevent species extinction and how insurance companies know what to charge you. These seemingly unrelated topics are connected by survival analysis, a statistical field begun in 1662. A lot has changed since then. Survival analysis, once concerned only with predicting death, is now used to model all binary events, anything that can only occur or not occur, like heart attacks or death. This technique is so powerful that it has almost certainly touched your life in some way. But that impact might have been negative, not because techniques are bad, but because data is. That's where my thesis comes in. By 2025, there will be 175 trillion gigabytes of data in the world. Given this, the idea of missing data seems almost unfathomable. Yet missing data is the foremost issue in modern survival analysis. Imagine a hospital tracking patients through cancer treatment, but patients switch hospitals. We don't know when they died then. And unless those missing death times are exactly like ones remaining in the study, final estimates are biased and inaccurate. Now imagine a patient walking into a doctor's. What the doctor tells them about how much time they have left with their family could be an over or underestimate because of bad statistics. There is a technique to fix this, and it's known as IPCW. The theory is simple. Imagine two women, Vera and Sarah. They're both 20, they have BMIs of 20, and their data is missing. But there's a third woman, Tara, and she, her data isn't. She's demographically identical, so she probably died around the same time. We can count Tara's data three times, thus meaningfully filling in the missing data and reducing inaccuracy. But this comes with assumptions, big ones. And it is important to test the boundaries of those assumptions, but when I looked at the literature, no one had. So I did. I pushed IPCW past the limits, and I found this technique can be much more widely used than we presently know. It can change the way we think about life, death, and everything in between. And I know, I know it can be hard to care about obtuse technical fields like statistics. <laughs> I know. But statistics impacts your life whether you care about it or not. And when the time comes, it might impact your death. So let's do a lot better than a guess. Let's know. Our next speaker from the Law, Jurisprudence, and Social Thought Department is Ryan Kyle. And the name of her speech is Returning to the Fundamentals. When we were in preschool and little Susie ordained herself supreme ruler of the playground, we went off to our teacher or another trusted adult to set things right. <laughs> and when we grew up and we entered the real world, we continued to witness and suffer from injustice. And we were taught to trust that the court system would set things right. Today, however, that trust has sunk to new lows. In wake of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, 47% or less than half of Americans reported that they trust in the judicial branch. But I didn't need a poll to tell me that, and you probably didn't either. We saw that fierce distrust at protests on this very campus. So I began asking myself, what would it take to restore that trust? In my thesis, I argue that the court needs to return to the fundamental principle of the US Constitution, 
human dignity. Now, the word dignity doesn't appear in the Constitution, but we can assume it's implied. Dignity, or the intrinsic worth of individuals, is what gives us the right to have any rights in the first place. And it is this protection of our dignity as a whole, and not simply the enumeration of those specific rights, that makes the Constitution worth defending. To determine how the court could integrate dignity into their decision making, I looked at four cases where the court did invoke dignity when discussing intellectually disabled individuals and the death penalty. Once the court determined that these individuals should be exempt from the death penalty, they assessed standards for legally diagnosing intellectual disability, a diagnosis that would determine whether an individual would live or die. Here, the court acknowledged that dignity was central, but they delegated authority over dignity to scientists and state legislatures. In doing so, they fundamentally misunderstood their duty to be the moral arbiters of our society. So, I argue that the court needs to change the way they think. Every time they decide a case, they need to consult dignity first and the scientists second, if at all. And even if we don't agree with the outcome, the court's effort to genuinely grapple with dignity and what it demands will be a win in and of itself. Now, I am fully aware that the court isn't going to change anytime soon, but we can change the society around them. To do so, we too need to return to the fundamentals. We need to return to the playground, to the place where we learn to recognize injustice. And now that that trusted adult has left the premises, it is more important than ever that each of us genuinely grapple with dignity and what it demands. In doing so, we will be able to have more productive conversations around certain polarizing issues, such as abortion, where two different concepts of dignity come into direct conflict with one another. So even if we can't restore trust in the court, we can restore some trust in each other. Our next speaker from the Black Studies Department is Talia Boda Ward, and the name of her speech is Recovering Names, Restoring History. My name is Talia. Talia is a nod to my great-grandmother, but not the Talia Farrow family. You see, last year, I found the 1819 estate inventory of my five times great-grandfather, Hey Talia Farrow, in microfilm at the Library of Virginia. In addition to livestock, furniture, and silverware, his property inventory named 19 enslaved people. Jeffrey, Louis, Jesse, Willis, Jim, Patience, Rose, Say, Alice, Matilda, Sam, Simon, Sarah, Macy, Millie, Kaylee, Clara, Alina, and Andrew. I'd known I was a descendant of enslavers, but I had never been faced with documents and I had never read their names. I realized that I had to not only remember and record, but also restore enslaved people to my family stories to tell a full and complete history. <laughs> Sorry. I had so many questions that drove me to write my thesis. What work were they doing? My, uh, Hayes' father-in-law owned over 50 enslaved people and recorded hundreds of bushels of wheat and thousands of pounds of pork produced each year on his properties. Was it an enslaved man like Jeffrey with the scythe chopping wheat or enslaved children like Alina and Millie raking and gathering it? Hay used Jesse and Louis as collateral for a loan. Did they live every day in fear of being ripped from their home to pay that debt? And as enslaved people became Virginia's largest export, did my family tear apart families and communities? To answer these questions, I turned to the archives to fill in the gaps of the context in the lives of the enslaved and the people enslaved by my ancestors. I asked myself, what does it mean to attach their names to my family stories? And as my mom says, how do I keep their memory alive in every breath that I take? 
genealogy is so often about how we memorialize our ancestors. And as white Americans, we have to ask ourselves, how are we doing that? And how are we memorializing the people that they enslaved? When we name, remember, and record enslaved people, we are better prepared for future action and reparations. <coughs> Sorry. We are better prepared for future action and reparations. Telling a full and complete history is essential to this work as white Americans. So who is in your history and who is missing? Our next speaker from the philosophy department is Sophie Woolmer, and the name of her speech is Solving the Organ Shortage Crisis, the Family's Role in Autonomous Donation. Imagine standing over the hospital bed of a loved one, watching in agony as they wait a transplant that will never come. This is the reality for 121,000 families in the United States, and for 7,000 of them each year, this wait will be in vain. Their loved one will die, because of the organ shortage crisis. The shortage of available organs is not a simple economic matter of supply and demand. It's an ethical issue caused by a disconnect between an individual's decision to donate and the final verdict made by their family. Despite 75% of US adults saying that they're willing to donate an organ, half of families refuse to carry out this decision, contributing to the severity of the crisis. It might surprise you to hear that this isn't a medical issue, but a philosophical one. It's true, this is why the crisis is worsening. Families are not considered in the bioethics that are taught to physicians. Neither are they given a voice in the organ transplant process itself. To heal the crisis, physicians need a framework that considers the needs of families. In my the I have dedicated my thesis to tackling this problem, first outlining the historic conflict between the institutions of medicine and the family. Then I pro provide physicians with a clear set of instructions on how to incorporate family values like collectivity, favoritism, and love into their discussions with donor families, because this is what's proven to increase rates of donation. I also propose that upon registering to become an organ donor at the DMV, an individual can appoint a family advocate to ensure that their donation decision is carried out. Now is the time to address the crisis. On March 23rd, the U.S. government announced that it's, it's investing $67 million to overhaul the broken transplant system. But they still haven't identified the true cause of the problem. The crisis persists because families are overlooked. The United Kingdom has already shown us the way forward. Through an advertising campaign where they encourage individuals to tell their family to donate, they've seen rates of successful transplantation skyrocket from 50 to 90%. We must follow suit. The time to act is now. I, join, I invite you to take a stand with me. Let's heal the broken transplant system by considering the needs of the family. It will save thousands of lives. Our last speaker from the history department is Tessa Levenstein. And the name of her speech is, The Future Depends on the Type of History Taught Today. There's a saying that old myths never die. Instead, we embed them in our textbooks. And in many ways, it's true. We have Florida, where lawmakers want to teach the civil rights movement without mentioning race. In Texas, the mythologized Battle of the Alamo is all that many students will learn of the US's land grab of Mexico. And in thousands of classrooms across the country, the closest that students come to learning Native history is their school's annual Thanksgiving play. We cannot move forward as a nation without understanding where we have been. My thesis reveals the little known history of a teacher who revolted against the prescribed curriculum to teach his students the truth about their history. And I discover that as a result, this single teacher inspired a movement that spanned a continent. In 1938, Ray Fadden was working as a public school teacher on the Akwesasne Reservation. Fadden belonged to the Mohawk Nation, as did all of the students in his classroom. But Fadden saw how his students were struggling within a system of education the US had 
created to destroy Native identity. At one point, when Fadden had his students create this poster on Mohawk governance, the principal of his school ordered that it be destroyed. And so Fadden just took this curriculum and implemented it outside of the classroom. After school, he brought his students to museums, historical sites, and Native reservations across the country. They made posters and pamphlets, wrote newspaper columns, creating and then disseminating their own homemade textbook on American history. My research tracks how when Fadden's students grew up, they went on to become some of the most important leaders in the Red Power Movement. One started an influential traveling college, another a seminal underground newspaper, and a third went on to lead the two-year occupation of Alcatraz Island. Not only that, they credited Fadden with having inspired their work. At the height of the Red Power Movement, one of Fadden's former students said, the name Ray Fadden means a great deal to Indians all over the continent. We would have no unity today had it not been for Ray Fadden. If a single teacher could inspire one of the most important social movements in all of American history while working against his school system, imagine if schools let go of their myth-making and taught history that was honest and true. Ray Fadden shows us that only when we teach our children about the past they have inherited can we finally create a nation that belongs to us all. We are going to take a brief break for the judges. We urge you to go ahead and vote for the people's choice. This is some of the judging criteria that the judges use, and you can share it as well. Thank you all for staying during that break time where we tabulated the scores. I have to say, this was the hardest one to score. You can imagine, right, just sitting out in the audience today, how just exceptional all of you were and are. And so it is my delight to read the names of the three winners for People's Choice, Runner Up, and First Place in the 2023 Three Minute Thesis Competition. And as I call your name, please come up and just stand next to me and we'll, I'll just make a little line here. I said earlier about how impressed I was with all of you. It means so much to me to have worked with all of you. I'm very sad that you're seniors and that you're gonna fly away because I feel like, oh, we just bonded. But, um, <laughs> story of my life. <laughs> Um, but I just want you to know, and I know it's a cliche, but it's true, you are all winners. And I mean, I mean, I know that sounds like... <laughs> In every way, not just what you wrote about, not just what you spoke about, but what you care about. You really do give us all hope for the future. So thank you winners, all 10 of you. And now, the certificates of awards for the People's Choice, what you all voted for. Congratulations to Kaylin Plunkett. And the runner-up for the 3MT 2023 goes to Tessa Levenstein. And the winner of the three minute thesis competition at Amherst College 2023 goes to Clara Page. Enjoy the rest of the many activities that are planned throughout the evening.